44. Starting December 11th, Fishing the DMV will be cutting back to only doing our Monday night live streams each week until we hit our first Patreon goal of 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 44 subscribers away from, e from achieving that goal. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a jackhammer chatterbait, you can help support the show. All Patreon supporters will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle each and every month. You'll also gain access to our private Facebook community, entered into weekly prize giveaways that'll be announced during Monday Night Live, access to members-only videos and live stream, and monthly prize giveaways, and just so much more. For only $6 a month, you can help us get there. And we are only 44 subscribers away from achieving this first goal. And then we'll be back to multiple episodes per week. Check the episode description down below or click the link above my head. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Monday Night Live, episode 31. We've done 31 weeks almost in a row, minus the one week that I basically was dying of God knows what element. I didn't get tested for it, but I'm alive, and that's all that matters. Thanks to everyone who tuned in last week for our two-year anniversary show. Sorry that we had some audio issues. I realized that the Roadcaster Pro had to be updated the software, the firmware, got that updated. I'm going to be beta testing that throughout the week, so be uh, be stay tuned for a patreon only members episode just so we can beta test the new firmware. i am on the old uh ford foresight forecaster uh it's just it's reliable it works i know the audio is going to work and i just didn't want to deal with all that that craziness tonight so i hope everyone's doing good tonight we get two weeks away from christmas and we got some fun things gotta get through the scheduling first before we get to our guests because this is kind of how monday night live works and to make sure people get to, to, to fill on in here. Uh, first thing up is our Patreon supporter of the week is Daniel Litwin. Daniel Litwin, you are the Patreon supporter of the week. Congrats. You just want a big old gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Message me on Facebook, Instagram, or email me at fishingdmv at gmail.com. And you can reclaim your gift card. Uh, this uh, In two weeks, the weekend, and no, I'm sorry, the week of Christmas, that Friday, so let me try that again, because that makes no sense. I'm babbling like a complete idiot. <clears throat> Friday, December 22nd, we will be live from Jake's Bait and Tackle for a special Christmas edition of the show. And we're going to have a couple of river rats on that are legends in the valley. Uh, Doc was able to go and find the cave that they lived in, bring them back to the 21st century. And we will be able to interview them with all their wonderful ways of how they do things. Uh, and then the last little announcement beforehand is, we are almost 40 Patreon supporters away from hitting our first goal. As always, I'm dialing back on shows this winter until we hit our goal. You guys know that I can pump out five shows a week. I was doing it for a while, except I was completely getting gassed. We hit 100 Patreon supporters. I'm going to be going back to four, five, even probably six shows a week. All we need is 40 Patreon supporters, and we're going to be there. 40 more, and we get there. So all that housekeeping's done. Today, we got a really fun episode. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, the Occoquan River itself, not the reservoir, but Occoquan River proper. There was a fishing tournament that was held there, and this guy did pretty well in it. He also decided that, you know what? I want to get into the fishing industry, and I want to work on boats, and he's pretty damn good at it. He worked on my boat, and my boat's pretty sad. He gave it a good facelift, and it has been working absolutely flawlessly this past year. He runs New Horizon Boat Works. I like to call it Boat Works, but it's New Horizon. Uh, he does all the wiring, all the stuff for it. I'm just going to bring this sucker on. Uh, he's a really awesome guy. Greg, thank you so much for coming on the show tonight. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for having me. So really, before we get into you know Occoquan River... How did your year go? Because if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong. You fish as a co-angler for the BFLs, and then you also fish the New Horizon Tournament Club, correct? I do. Yeah. Yeah. So I've participated with the BFLs and uh, a lot of the MLF tournaments for over close to about 10, 11 years now. Um, and then I also fish with New Horizon bass anglers up in Northern Virginia. And then I do a few of the Sunday morning series here on Lake Anna. Um, but as far as the tournament season went, that was the worst BFL season I've I've about had this uh, this year. But I did get the meet. Uh, I got paired with Chris Dillo hmm. out of uh, I believe it's Waynesboro, but he has about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in winnings with 
BASS and FLW and just a nominal, nominal sick. That that's the thing that's so that always turned me off to being a a co angler, I guess. And, and granted, you and I both have boats, so we do have options. I know some people don't, but it's such a luck of the draw. Like, granted, your skill is important, but then depending on the voter you get, they can also inhibit your success. Let's say it that way. Yeah. You know, I've been really fortunate with, with at being as a co-angler is I've, I've had maybe two experiences that were not great, but the rest of them, I mean, I've fished with some, uh, I mean, absolute top pros like Justin Lucas and Michael Neal. Um, and then I, I fish with uh, boaters who are just new to bass fishing and you get to, really see how everyone picks everything apart and what their process is and it's just a, it's a wonderful educational experience and then you you know the cost is you know a lot less expensive than if you were going to fish as a boater you know it's a 110 dollars entry fee and you have the possibility of winning three thousand mm-hmm. dollars and then at the end of the year you know bring new phoenix so you know when you weigh in the financial standpoint of it it's you know everyone has their their opinions when it comes to it but I've, I mean, I've been I've been drawn with top pros and I've outfished them and I've been drawn with, you know, uh, you know, beginners and had my butt whooped. But, you know, I absolutely love being able to do it. That's one reason I'm going to probably get back into the kayak fishing or I'm going to get into the kayak fishing a little bit more heavily this coming year. Um, next week, guys, I'll be announcing all the all the schedules I'm fishing. But it's because it's just it's the pay to like winning ratio is so much better. Um the BFLs keep going up in price. If you're a boater, it's insane. And gas and housing, it's, it's hard to make a living at it. And you're right. Like a co-angler or kayak series, best bang for your buck out there right now. It really is. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, the co-angler fee went from a hundred dollars a tournament to 110. Sure. And that's been in, I mean that when I started fishing the BFLs in 2014, it was hundred dollars. Even payouts were just about the same. And, you know, the participants kind of fluctuate. You might have anywhere between, you know, 100 to 150 boats, depending on, you know, if the regionals on the, you know, Potomac or the James, usually when it's out of town, it kind of, you know, your your numbers kind of start to to drop. But, um, yeah, it's it's been a great, it's, a, it's honestly a great deal. So, so talk about this talk tournament about this that you tournament. just had with... Um on Aquaquan river was it part of new horizon it was so new horizon puts on a uh their fall classic about the first or second week in november and it is out of anything i fish throughout the year it's my it's my absolute favorite and the reason being is you know it'll get into the sometimes it'll get into the high 20s early you know low 30s at night and it'll get into the 50s during the day. And it's like a real fall, I wouldn't even say transition, like it, it's it's past that. Um, and it's really cool with the Potomac is, and for everyone who knows us, you know, it's a giant, basically a giant grass flat as far as the river goes. Now with the Aquaquan, I think it's the most diverse creek from the Woodrow Wilson down to the 301. Because it's roughly about, you've got about five miles of fishable water until you get past about the 120, I think it's the 123 bridge. Um, But you have everything from 20 feet of water with ledge drop-offs. You've got bridge pilings. You've got every marina you can can imagine. It's such a diverse, uh, basically, feeder creek to the Potomac. And it acts as a winter haven for all species, everything across the board. So a lot of those fish that spend their their time throughout the season in Belmont Bay or pass into, uh, I might even say as far as Mason Act. Probably, yeah. Um, And everything migrates through. And they spend their, and they've got, they can be in 20 feet of water, and then they can be up in about two feet of water. And what's crazy, and the Potomac's been fishing a lot better than it has in recent years. It it seemed in the mid-2000s, it was, you had pretty high weight. 
And then around 2012 was like one of the best years. And then it's been kind of, it's kind of looked like the stock market ever since. <laughs> but it's so cool around the first week, the grass bite is either, it, it's like a flick of a switch where it just dies. You will either get around several fish that are in the three to four pound range. And then the next day the bass, the, the bite, the grass bites dead. And then you can go and you can go further, you know, in up up the river itself, away from the Potomac, and you can start getting into the hard covers, you know, the marinas and um, a lot of the old pilings with the, you know, the Route One bridge, the, the uh, train trestle. I mean, it's got practically everything that you'd you'd want to fish. So, what was your thought process going to this tournament? So, I don't. I, I didn't get a chance to pre-fish, so I drove up from from uh, Fork Union, got to the got to the ramp, and when I put in, water temperature was about 52, 53, and once it gets down to that mark, like I said, you can you can kind of dissect some of the grass out towards the mouth, and it's either going you're either going to catch them, or you're not. Hmm. And it's it seems like it's that first two weeks, which is the deciding factor on if you're going to have anything, and then it's and then it's over, and then it's all to hard cover. Um, and I've basically fished the same exact mindset, or call it strategy, uh, for for you know just about the past ten years. Um, and so I made my way down about to the last third. Uh, right before you got to Belmont Bay. And you've got a lot of shoreline that has isolated, uh, you know, late, basically submerged laydowns. Uh, you can basically look at the bank and you'll start seeing a row of uh, trees and basically aquatic marsh. And it's got about, at a high tide, you've got about a foot and a half. And it seems like the colder the night, the shallower they 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 will be when actually when the sun starts coming up, like they want to get as shallow as possible just to get that sun, and then they start backing off. And I was able then the first fifteen minutes to catch a three and a half pounder and then a two pounder on in you know back to back casts, and that's by about seven thirty. Um, and so I started going through stuff that I haven't really paid much attention to, just banks that were shallow, trying to come up with to see if this was just kind of a, you know, a one and done deal or if that was kind of something I could I could go after. Um, and that not being the case, I went ahead and I ran out of the uh, out of the river and then I was right around high point. Uh, and it's a grass flat that. It gets a lot of pressure. It's basically a community hole. Um, it's about a quarter mile away from what you would call Belmont Bay. And I ended up catching two more keepers, one that's about four and a half, one that's about another two. And this is by about 10 o'clock. And it was really nice to see the Potomac having a mixture of grass, eel, hydrilla, milfoil, and it was cleared. Mm -hmm. We haven't had a whole lot of rain up in that part of the, you know, in that region for uh, I mean, quite some time. I'd say probably it was probably pretty clear for about two weeks as far as the weather went. And that just told me, I said, hey, as long as I'm not dealing with muddy, wa muddy cold water, then there might be a little bit of hope. Um, and in my mind, when I caught when I caught those two, I was telling myself, I said, you know, this is probably one of those light switch days where it's going to be completely dead after this. You you basically got the last day of that grass bite, and now it's the get into the hard, the, you know, the hard stuff. Um, so I actually turned off all of my graphs after that, and I had plenty of hour, uh, plenty of time to fill out my limit, even call if, if possible. And then I started at the mouth in the one of the first uh, main yacht clubs, and then I just worked my way down, and I just fished slow, and then I turned on live scope. And now I didn't catch fish directly through live scope, but just to see what was around, 
let, let, let's break that down some more because there was so much information there that I want to make sure. And again, guys, as always, we have close to 30 people watching tonight, which again, I am shocked because last week we had 40, 50 people in December. It shows how many people are fast crazy even in this time. Drop a question. You win a prize. Jake's Bait and Tackle gift card. That's how all these Monday Night Lives work. Ask a, ask a question. If I pick it, you win a gift card. So Yacht Club, you start there, you work your way down. You're hitting cover. But you said something interesting. You turned your electronics off, but then later on in the day, you said, I'm going to turn them back on. Yes. Explain that thought process to the people at home. So with the Potomac, you really just need a GPS if you're not used to being on that river, just for navigational purposes. My rule of thumb is I am never fishing uh, more than five or six feet. So basically, I'll keep an eye to where I can see bottom, back my boat off to where I can't see it anymore. So now I'm in about that four to five foot range, and then I start going. So I'm I'm basically being able to fan cast around, and I'm covering out into you know a foot of water, two feet, three up the you know so on and so forth. And I turn off all of my electronics, so there's nothing pinging, there's no noise. I keep the trolling motor to someone on low because we all know the Potomac's a very popular, popular river and mm -hmm. you have a ton of, I mean, you know, all anglers across the board. So it was, it was kind of more of the stealth approach. What base mm -hmm. did you start the day with? Uh, I am a huge fan of the evergreen uh, jackhammer. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I've, I've, I, I absolutely love being able to fish chatterbait. And I think now that I live down here and I fish Anna, I don't get to do it enough. Um, but it, 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 you know, it's an absolute, it's a staple on the Potomac. It's a staple on most tidal rivers. Um, but I, I kind of go with a kind of a bluegill color. I keep it that nat, you know, natural green pumpkin, blue and orange type deal. Um, and I keep a compact profile and then I just go from there. And, and and the reason being is you've got a huge bluegill and yellow perch population, and a lot of them spend their time in the aquaquan in the winter. So you have that migration coming through of all species, and you'll notice as you get up shallower in some of these grass, uh, these you know these grassy areas that you'll actually start seeing seeing small schools of them, one or twos. Um, and, you know, I'm not competing with a whole school of shad. I'm competing with, you know, maybe two or three bluegill that, that are in, you know, you know, relative vicinity to my boat. So that's, that's where I start with, with bait selection. Guys, I love, you guys are just killing the comment section with so many questions. We're going to get to them here in a minute. I guess my thought was when I said, oh, wow, to the chatterbait, I guess it's, is the chatterbait you consider 12 months out of the year on the river or? I don't know. I, I just never thought of a chatterbait as a 12 month bait for the Potomac. Um, I mean, I wouldn't bet against it. Just the amount of vibration that it puts out. I'm if I can catch them in June with that type of vibration and I, and I put away the, you know, lipless crankbait, but the lipless crankbait plays in, you know, that December, January, February, early March, it's got some of the same characteristics. Um, so, I mean, it's it, that's one of the first things I pick up whenever I, you know, I, I get to the Potomac and uh, I mean, I've, I've fished as early as into January, February, and I've caught them before. Hmm. Um, it's not my go to, but it's definitely on the front deck. We got want to make sure we get to these questions first because I don't want them to get away. Uh, Big Mike Fishing Chronicles says, how do I get more information about um, joining this club? I'm assuming you're talking about New Horizon. Um, email me or Greg, and I think we can get you information on that, honestly, for New Horizon. Uh, I th I'm pretty sure they're taking members, right? They are taking members. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, Big Mike Fishing Chronicles, uh, fishing the DMV at gmail.com or New Horizon Boat Builds. I don't have that memorized. Uh, uh, but either one of us, reach out. We'll get you information on that. Okay. We got Russell... Hamilton, who just won a gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Russell, please message me on Facebook or Instagram or email me. I'll get it to you. What is your favorite tide? It's definitely the outgoing. Um, 
the and you'll hear this from everyone's the either the first two hours outgoing or the last two hours of outgoing um that's that's always been and that happens to be pretty much on every tidal river you'll go to uh it condenses everything and then the incoming tides generally you're you're basically pumping water back in and adding more surface area and it's it's causing those fish to actually be able to to, to branch out and 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 basically search you know um but yeah def definitely low tide those those first two went the first and last two hours of being that window right on right on and guys just keep on asking the questions and we'll take small breaks to make sure we get them all answered uh as you continue you're going through your day you don't have a you don't have a keeper yet you're starting at the yachts and you're working your way down do you have a when do you get your first keeper well i actually that it's a two-day tournament so the first day uh i had i had my four and my big two my four and a half and three and a half by about 10 10 a.m and I spent a, about an hour and a half in the grass and never got a bite after. Hmm. And that was just kind of like, okay, it's time to pull the plug. And you know, you can go and catch fish on these marinas. And, and that's where the life scope comes into play. Gotcha. So I start at the mouth and I'm basically working my way back down to where we launch. And I've got about four hours. Uh, yeah. I'd say about four hours of working with the hard cover. Um, and I turned on live scope and I just kind of panned around. I wasn't, I wasn't casting it where my cone, where I was, I had my transducer pointed, but I could tell if I was in six feet of water, you would have certain posts that were closer to the river channel that were just lined up with everything. Mm -hmm. And that was bluegill crappie, um, and, and, you know, large mouth, of course what did you make a bait change are you live scooping with a chatter bait at this point uh i went straight to a drop shot that makes more sense okay yeah yeah the um uh, honestly if if i had to go out with one rod it would be it would be a drop shot with that six inch you know robo or morning dawn i mean the amount of fish that people catch on that out out on there everywhere yeah. it's incredible and it still produces I, I really would love to know what that pink looks like six to seven feet under the water on the Potomac. Um, I, I get it on like Lake Hartwell, but I've just always been curious, like on the Potomac, what that thing looks like to them. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, yeah. So I went to a drop shot and I, 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 and I would, I'd look around to see if there's anything kind of roaming out a rat, you know, outside of the pylons. Um, and I didn't really see much. So I focused on that first third of these these uh, marina slips, and I was able to catch uh, was able to catch my limit right there. So about eleven, this is about twelve o'clock. I've I've got my limit, and um, and that's when I started kind of working my way back and and seeing if I could upgrade or find something for the second day of the tournament. So that's a good, it's a good question. I ask all of my, uh, all of my big championship winners here on the show is when you have a multi-day event in your brain, do you ever switch to practice mode? Do you ever feel like I have a solid enough limit that I really do need to just look and get ready for day two? Yeah, it's either, it's, it's, it, it's kind of 50, 50 for me. Um, it's either I'm going to, burn this area as much as i can just because i have not a clue what's going to happen the next day but as familiar as i am with the aquaquan i knew that hey you're going to have fish everywhere around these marinas you know go ahead and start you know exploring and, and looking and just kind of you know scouting um so I was able to, like, I didn't need to, you know, burn an entire marine. I knew that there were going to be fish there. So I could, you know, I could leave it alone and go and see if I could upgrade on other areas. Um, and, and then, you know, and then come back to that the, the following day. Now, if that was something new that I had never been to, and the fish that I were catching were pretty good quality, and say they were dead, you know, I was dedicated to fishing hard stuff, I would have blown apart a marina. and then um because you know i have no idea what to expect for the second day 
but I kind of knew that first day, hey, I can I can do this again. It's going to be tougher, but I can still do it. So, you know, with that, with that said, day two happens, you're going to get up there. Um, and then honestly, well, it's first before we get into that after day one, what is your weight? Where are you in the standings for the tournament? So out of, I think we had 15 competitors and I was in second place with just shy of 14 pounds, nice. which, which for, uh, for the Potomac at this, you know, in, in, you know, the beginning of November is not bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, out of the eight or nine years I fished this tournament, I think the biggest weight we had was about 15, close to 16. Um, but that was, that was, you know, that was a, a thing about five years ago, give or take. Um, so I was, I was super thrilled with that. And I had big, I was leading big fish with a four and a half pound pounder. So was that, that was a grass nice fish or a marina fish? That was a grass fish. That was a grass fish. Okay. That makes yeah. sense. So yeah, I mean, you're going to bed that night and this is with anybody that's uh, has a competitive bone in their body and are doing well, your mind's probably racing. Are you thinking grass? I got to hit the grass first and then go to the marinas or are you going to go straight to the marinas? Uh, I, I knew what, what was possible. And instead of searching and fishing stuff that I had any, any of the grass I hadn't been to, I went back to a, uh, a quarter mile section and I gave it, I gave it about two hours and never caught a nothing not a no no bite no loss fit nothing just dead and i knew i said okay that was that was the day that was that was the switch it, it it's gone from grass it it didn't get super cold that night but it's it's progressed the the weather change has progressed enough to where that grass bites over you need to go into the river and do your thing with the marinas um was the two hour time limit was a two hour time limit something you gave yourself as the day progressed or before you even launched, you said two hour hard stop and then I'm bouncing. Uh, I, I waited until I was actually at my starting spot and it was a 50 yard stretch. And I knew I'm saying, Hey, if I can get bit here, which is relating to relating to grass and hard cover, then I've got more time. But if I don't, I'm going to limit myself. And historically, that's what I need to be doing. So, you know, after I, I went without a bite for about, you know, 20 minutes on this stretch, I went to the main grass flat, said, all right, you've got two hours, do what you need to do, and then leave it. And then if, if you know, if plan A doesn't work, you go to B and you commit to it. That's, that's so mature. I could not do that. Uh, Russ Hamilton said, my wife was talking. How much did he have the first day? Uh, I'm pretty sure you said 14 pounds, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, just shy of it. So there you go, Russ. Just, just tell her to pipe down for a quick second while the show's on. I'm just kidding. Um, we got a couple more questions, but let's just get into the tournament. Then we'll at, we'll get get to everyone's questions. Again, uh, ask a question. Uh, you get a chance to win a gift card, Jake's main tackle. Two hours. It's not working out. Boom, we're going to move back to the marinas. Do you just pick up the drop shot and just immediately go to work? Yeah, so I picked up a drop shot and a uh, finesse style shaky head, and I live scoped probably f- three different marinas, and I knew it. And for some reason, after not getting only catching, I think I had one two pounder by about eight o'clock. And now, granted, the, the day prior I had about three. And two, you know, two pretty quality fish. And I said, okay, this is going to be a little bit tougher today. And that's the way it's trending. So let's just slow down. We're going to, we're, we're going to take our time and we're going to pick as much of this, you know, we'll take three or four marinas and just pick this apart. And I could not get anything to commit. And I have my second keeper at about nine o'clock. And, you know, I'm catching it, I catch it in six feet of water off of a pylon in a marina. And after that, I never caught anything the rest of the day. And it was, I probably saw a hundred bass and I saw schools of crappie and perch and bluegill. And I had followers, but they would just kind of 
settle back. They would it, it would just be the watch that drop shot or that shaky head go down, and then they they'd run off. I hate that God, I hate that. Did you? What kind of changes did you try to make? Uh, I slowed down a, a a good amount, and I, I went from fishing that traditional you know morning dawn uh, uh, robo worm to a uh, a, Z, a Z drop, which is a uh, zoom product. It's basically a, it looks like a leech. It's like a four inch uh, kind of flat sided uh, shaky head worm. And I rigged that on a uh, 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 shaky head uh, jig hook made by Tree Shaker Tackle. And, and, and I could not make him commit. And it's a very finesse style. I mean, the total, the total makeup of it's about four inches. Um, and it just, it did not happen. Um, and the tournament results showed, I mean, there was only one limit out of 15, uh, 15 people caught that day as compared to about, I think we had about seven or eight limits Damn. Saturday. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it went, it went downhill. Wow. Yeah. That's rather quickly. That's that getting to that wintertime fishing kind of style there. And, and since we are basically getting to that time of year, did you ever tr- did you ever think about or have you ever had experience using a blade bait or like a tamiki rig on the river? I I I haven't. Um, I've the times that I've been out there in the winter time, uh, and we're saying like past November, uh, the the Ned rig, uh, a jerk bait, and uh, some sort of finesse jig. Those have always been what I I I run to. Um, but I, when I get, and I guess you bring up the blade bait, the the silver buddy. That's that's always been, and I know you've got probably about fifty variations now of that bait, oh, and they're God. all over, you know, ten dollars, and they're just great detail. <laughs> but kind of like I kind of like the simplicity of the silver buddy. I feel I like that like does the price tag too. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's the only problem is like, so I love the Domeki Vault as a blade bait, but good Lord, it is so expensive for a bait that you know you're going to lose. Um, it, yeah, it's just absolutely so frustrating why they make it so expensive. And then I know, boss, I'm going to get to your question here. He's like, he's pumped that this out a couple of times. We have uh, Randy Purdue, who's a Patreon right now. I know my, my, my Facebook Patreon page is weird. It will not show the user's name, but I have it up here too. Um, uh, Randy says, uh, I live in Salem, Virginia. If... If I were to travel there and fish the Potomac, where should I, where should a novice start? Thanks. That's a good question. And Randy, you just want to give card to Jake's bait and tackle. You know the drill, message me and I'll give it to you. So if you are a first time uh, angler on the Potomac, I would go straight to Woman. With Woman and the Aquaquan are the, in my opinion, are the most diverse and i think i said this in the beginning are definitely the the most diverse creeks on the river um the aquaquan it has a mixture of everything hard cover lily pads grass marine anything you can think of you can fish it with mad woman you have a large uh winding feeder creek that runs back i'd say probably about three miles maybe more mm-hmm. But you have a ton of shallow grass flats and you have resident fish that do not leave that creek because they can go deep, they can go shallow. And you have a sufficient bait, you have a sufficient, you know, uh bait population that really has no need to leave. Um, and this is this is something I just want to add on to basically what you're saying, because I believe in it is most of the majority of those major creeks on the river you can win in. Somebody has won a tournament every year out of one of those creeks. Matter woman and of course, you know, um Aquaquan definitely have the deep water thing. But but I think the issue is for people that have a boat and you have a 250 or whatever on the back, you have this urge in the back of your reptilian brain. I have it too. I'm guilty that I gotta I gotta move. I have to use it. You don't have to. Don't leave the creek. If you don't leave the creek. And this is because, and I say that because just because Bassmaster says like low tide is perfect, maybe perfect that day is low tide and 20 minutes into low tide or vice versa. It changes. It's never like the exact 
perfect same time every time. It just fluctuates just a little bit. And if you leave, you're going to miss that bite. Personal opinion, but I just think don't leave. Just stay in the creek and you'll have success. Yeah, and, and you know, we've heard the whole running the tide deal where you're basically starting at, at either one end of the river and then following the tide as it progresses inward or out to sea. You don't really hear about people doing that anymore. Mm-mm. I don't know if it's still a thing, but it, it's it's kind of it doesn't get any any light. And really, lately, a lot of the professional tours that have been out there, you haven't seen it happen. And and with the and and with the tidal system, just with the say the Potomac, you can start your motor in the morning, get to your spot, and not start it again until you leave to go back the way in. And you can fish an area through all phases of the tide and you'll never miss that window. Mm-hmm. So you can basically find your find a group of fish that you're you're gonna key in on, stay. And it, it's actually kind of nice because you know that they're there and you're just waiting. And you can kind of and it, it it and and me personally, it relaxes me completely. I can I can just take my time. I can do exactly what I need to do. And when it happens, it's going to happen. And you know, it's in that window. I feel like there's a decompression period when you, when you drop your boat down off plane and you get set up on a spot. It's weird. Like when you go into the woods, if you're hunting and you walk into the woods and you sit down, you can tell like nature has been stirred up and it takes some time for stuff to settle. And I feel like that that's the same thing on the water. Generally speaking, when I fish, when you set down, I usually don't make the first cast and I catch one. It's one of those things that feels like it settles down and I get back into a groove and then you're going to get bit. And when you don't run, that's an added benefit that you never really get out of that groove. You're calm, you're quiet in the area and you can pick it apart and you can watch the fish change positioning and as they move throughout the day. Um, and I guess Russ has a, Russ is on fire today, but um, Russ has another comment here. Uh, I've won in those two creeks plenty of times and Aquan. Yeah, a hundred percent. Those are, those are really, really good creeks. Um, and then JP, uh, JP Harlan, JP, you just want a gift card to Jake's bait and tackle message me on Instagram, Facebook, or email me fishing the DMV at gmail.com to reclaim your gift card. Uh, hard to beat a blade bait, uh, in the winter time. A hundred percent. It's just that you're gonna have to go through about $200 worth of blade baits. Cause they, you're going to snag them. It's not if it's when, um, and then last question, just kind of get up all caught up to this. Cause I know we got a segue here soon. Um, Greg, do you put a trailer on your chatterbait? And then I'm going to add to his question. What type? Uh, so I try and keep my bait selection as simple as possible. I either go with a crawl style, like the zoom ultra vibe speed crawl. Um, and then if I want something that's got more of a swimming action and less vibration, I'll go with the, uh, Lake Fork shad. Um, it's a, uh, it's, it's a small three and a half inch swim bait trailer. It's, it's in the tails and segment. So it's got a nice, you know, it, it's not too overpowering, but it's, it's got a nice kind of S wave type movement to it. Um, and those are the two styles that I go with. I, I try not to get, there's, there's an ungodly amount of selection, uh, as far as soft plastics go. So I keep it either one or the other, you know, white, green pumpkin, uh, you know, black and blue, that's it. And I just rotate through all of that just to keep it simple. That's what you got to do. I mean, unless you really just want to go down a rabbit hole of owning way too much tackle and your wife getting upset at you, uh, you got to keep it simple and budget it out. Um, to, to put a bow into the, into the tournament, how much weight did you, you finish up with on the two days combined? Uh, so I had close to 14 the first day. The second day I had two for maybe four and a half pounds. Okay. Uh, so I had a, somewhere around 17, close to 18 total. Um, and then it took 21 to win. Um, and, and the boater who was leading the first day had about 15 pounds. Uh, second day he had three fish for maybe six. Wow. Uh, give or take. And that was that was enough to get him uh, get him paid. So again, um, I think I think the biggest thing there, guys, to understand is be flexible. You know, don't just die in the grass. Be able to move things around, and really, how important um, 
those marinas are in the wintertime as you approach it. And then you mentioned something else, and this will be a great kind of segue uh, to the other part of our show here. But with the live scope, you said that you didn't specifically see them. You didn't snipe the fish. Is that because you would like point at them, make your cast and then turn away? Or were there some other things there going on? I, I used this basically as a search tool. I wanted to find basically what depth that they were holding. Um, and, you know, the one thing with the marinas out there are the, from where they hit land, you might have about two feet and then it comes out and gradually drops off and then you'll hit the river channel. So the end of that marina is in 20 feet of water. So what I've historically found is that they will be in a, in, in sort of a depth range where they'll either be shallow, mid or deep. And that was in, in panning around with live scope was more just to see, okay, they're in about 14 feet of water, which on the Potomac, that's completely, you know, non-traditional, but that was, you know, that was, it was basically just, you know, a tool. Um, so I was able to find those, keep that beam off. Uh, part of me was starting to think that keeping that beam on them in that close and that shallow of a range, they were starting to feel that. And I know the word's gone around the internet about being able to pull up on spots and you point out at a brush pile and then all of a sudden they just disperse. Mm -hmm. And there's about six different frequencies right on them. Um, and I started to pick up on that throughout the end of the day. And I was thinking, I'm like, that's really strange. As soon as I point that on, they just stop. They're not, they're not, they're, they're not investigating. They're not moving. They're just there. They are um, getting educated really quick and it's insane because it's supposed to be a dumb 12 inch fish, but good God, they, they get educated so freaking quick to this stuff. It's insane. And I, I saw it, um, <clears throat> on all the tournaments I fished at the end of the year on big slack, which is on the upper Potomac with smallmouth, you shine, you shine that cancer beam at them in 60 feet or less from the boat you're not getting bit period if it's if it's less than 60 feet i never got bit um if it was it was a dink that was an inch long but no keeper at all right it, it's just i don't know now i do hear pros saying like what they're doing is they'll point the cast and then they'll push it away and then they'll make the cast um which is something maybe i'll start doing next year honestly to see if that helps i just think the hardest thing for people that get live scope and this is my opinion because you know and then we're gonna get into this you installed the live scope and my mega this year so this is the first time i've run uh forward facing sonar i'm not i'm i'm very accustomed to 360 but is not to snipe all the time your brain tells you to always snipe <clears throat> and i think that will make you really bad at fishing live scope what it's good at is giving you a shit ton of information and making your decision process super quick but the kryptonite to it is if you have it, you think you just want to stare at it all the time and just cast to individual fish versus what I helped me at is, hey, you cast this point. There's no bait in this pocket. There's no point in me being here. There's nothing. There's no life here. Let's move. They're at the bottom. No, they're suspended. Little things that if you're a good angler, that'll help you make really quick decisions. You know, the amount of information you can pick up with it just scanning around. It, I mean, I keep myself on autopilot where I'm making, you know, repetitive casts as I'm, as I'm going down the stretch, but I'm also just take any time that my trolling motor is not in, in use, I'll just start, I'll start panning around just to keep an eye out for anything that's around me. Um, and then I'm just trying to kind of pick up as much info like you were saying. It's what you have to do. And I get it. It's time of the year also. And I know that's something I'm going to probably get killed with the comment section, but like there's time of the years that you can snipe a little bit better. But generally speaking, that's what I've just seen. And good Lord, people are just killing. Okay. Dave Smith, I I'm going to get you in here, Dave. I'm sorry. Here we go. Dave Smith with, with uh, guys, if you don't know, <clears throat> if you guys are interested in actually joining New Horizon, you can pick on Dave Smith. Uh, Dave Smith is uh, part of New Horizon Bass Anglers. Reach out to him on Facebook. He'll help you out there too. Uh, so the winning weight there, uh, day one was 15.60. Day two was 6.10. Just to give you kind of a little bit more clarification there. We have, of we have, oh God, I'm going to try. Crappy Kev. I'm going to assume that's what your name is. I apologize if I messed that up. Crappy Kev, what is Greg's favorite baits for fishing the river in the winter? That would be either a jerkbait, either a Lucky Craft pointer, 
or a Megabass uh, Vision 110, or a, uh, I hand tie my own jigs. So I, I'll fish a quarter ounce uh, finesse football, it, which, and I've taken that design from a bunch of other different companies. Um, it's nothing special, but those those two are ap absolute go go tos for the winter, and they work everywhere, mm -hmm. not just the Potomac. I mean, a jerk bait in and of itself is just such a universal bait to actually have uh, on your boat and to be using. And then again, guys, you know, as always, because apparently I'm not sponsored by them, but I pimp them out like they are. Spy bait is also a good bait if you're in clear water impoundments to add that to your arsenal. Um, crappy Kev. All right. You know what? I'm going to do this. I usually try to hand out this many, but you just want to gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. Um, I'm acting like Mr. Beast tonight. Please message me on Facebook or Instagram, or you can reach out to me at fishingdmv at gmail.com. You just want to gift card to Jake's Bait and Tackle. I think we got all caught up on that. Nope. We got Dave Smith. My goodness, guys, you are so chatty tonight. Dave Smith, Silver Buddy was a great bait when the bass and the bait would stack up along the rock bluff wall, but we haven't had that happen in the November tourney in a long time. But I definitely think what Dave you should be doing is let's have that tournament in December. Let's do it over Christmas because my my family works all Christmas. So I'll go out there and fish a tournament right now. That's no problem. But that's uh, that's a really good point there. When it comes to live scope, that is a absolute power hog, and that kind of gets into the shirt that you're wearing and really what you did with my boat because my boat guys is about six thousand years old, and. Greg, you run a business and you made that thing absolutely sing this year. And I had no mechanical issues with it for the first time in about 20 years. How did you, how did you get in and just like, tell the whole story to everyone that's listening right now? Well, this, this was pretty, uh, this took a long time. It was a long time in the making. Uh, when I was 19, I got into the electrical trade <clears throat> and I worked my way up uh, through a four year apprenticeship. Uh, I went into a union contractor as an electrical coordinator. Uh, I relocated down to Charlottesville. Uh, I went back into the field. Uh, I obtained my journeyman's license and my master electrician's license. Um, uh, just about, yeah, yeah, about four, was it four years ago? Time flies. The, uh, and I, I, I developed an absolute passion for electrical work. And I mean, it's everything from the install to planning uh, to going through the National Electric Code. Um, it's 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 like it's up there with bass fishing, but not quite. Um, and I met a gentleman who runs the a similar type of business out at Smith Mountain Lake, and he was a complete inspiration uh, to start New Horizon boat builds. And I, so I basically took 14 years of knowledge with uh, bass boats and marine electronics, trolling motor, shallow water anchors. And then I applied all of the knowledge that I've learned in commercial construction uh, for over a decade now. And uh, I've been able to merge those two and be able to install trolling motors, uh, all sorts of marine electronics, lighting systems, to where they're installed by an electrician and they're going to work properly and it's code compliant. What is some advice is that you would give? I mean, guys, yeah. if you hey, have guys. some questions, oh, a little bit of echo there, sorry about that. Um, what are some, what's some advice that you could give people that are listening here for their boat builds? And then if people have a question in the comment section for Greg, this is a great time. If you guys have a boat question, an electrical question to get it answered. So, one thing that we do offer is a consultation service. So if you have you have your bass boat and you want to add marine electronics or a trolling motor or shallow water anchors, but you don't really know where to start, I basically go into a deep dive of where you're fishing. And so we'll take, you know, hypothetically say you fish the Potomac and the James maybe a couple times a year, but you predominantly fish, you know, Lake Anna or Kerr or Smith Mountain, then we lean more towards uh, Humminbird Electronics or more of a Johnson Outdoors system. And the reason behind that um, is their mapping 
and and I can say this from personal experience because I did create the maps at one point for Johnson Outdoors. I was one of their We're surveyors. About that because that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the yeah, we'll yeah, we'll go we'll go over that. The um, and I have seen how their maps are. The data is gathered uh, during the survey process. I've seen how the maps are made uh, up in actual Little Falls, Minnesota, where Lake Master is headquartered, and it is downright the best data collection and map creation that you can find. Uh, Navionics and CMAP fall more under uh, government data. So basically your tidal systems or anything that's connected to the Chesapeake or the Atlantic, that stuff is pretty accurate. I mean, the two captains you see out there on the Potomac are using the same Navionics map that, that you are. There's very little difference. Um, so I either tend to go towards Lowrance and Garmin products if it's for navigation on title systems. Um, and I lean more towards Hummingbird if it's for inland on basically every main main body of water in in the country. Which that makes so much sense so as to sense. why pros try to use both electronics why they actually go to Lorraine's and hummingbird and garmin is to get the best of every world possible and again i get it if money allows yes the um i've actually i've i fished with um i fished the flw tour in 2018 as a co-angler for the full season uh so i and and i fished the flw tour majors uh in previous years dating back all the way to 2012 and i have uh i was actually able to get on um well let me let me get to the late master deal uh i got paired with justin atkins at the bfl all american back in 2017 and justin when he started out as a tour rookie he was a surveyor um and that was the year that he won the Forestwood Cup. And he left Lake Master, still still with a deal with uh, Johnson Outdoors. And him and I hit it off. I told him, I said, hey, you know, any if, if you need a place to stay, if you come to the Potomac, who do I need to talk to? You know, you know, could I have some contact information for Johnson Outdoors? And next thing, I, a month later, I was at Customs going through in the official paperwork to uh, survey Lake St. Clair up in Detroit. That's so cool, dude. That is a really cool story. Yeah. Yeah. If, uh, yeah, if I didn't qualify or if I, yeah, if I didn't double qualify for the all American, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. Um, and then to be at that year with Justin Atkins, get paired together on the, you know, on the second day of the tournament, it was just absolutely, you know, it was, it's a crazy story. Since you have such a background and Lonnie, you have a great question. I want to make sure we get to that too. Um, who has the best external GPS puck out of the three variants? And I bring this up because everyone asks me what the important piece of equipment is. And one that I mentioned that no one talks about is like making sure you can triangulate your waypoints. Um, you don't need live scope for that, but you should be able to triangulate it. So what company do you think has the best like external GPS puck? I would have to say Lowrance, uh, from the word from from the word on the street, it's definitely Lowrance. Um, but that GPS technolo technology is utilized across all three brands, and it's it, it, there's nothing special to it. And I don't think you can go wrong with it because it's it's baseline the same technology. Um, it's it, it, it's it's not like comparing Active Target with Garmin LiveScope. Okay. It's more like a base technology that's been around. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, hope, hope I'm uh, I'm I'm covering that correctly. Basically, yes. any brand's any external brand. puck will be okay. In my opinion, yeah. And then we got a little bit harder of a question right here. It is uh, from Lonnie. Yeah. Can you get interference out of a Mega Three Hundred and Sixty? That yes, <laughs> yes. And the best thing you can do is separate your transducer uh, from, and, and I'm, I'm sure that question was related to 
to uh, forward facing sonar. Uh, but you want to separate your transducers as much as possible um, and also try and isolate the power source as well. Um, you want to keep that on the opposite side from your trolling motor uh, feeds uh, from their source. And, and if you can, have a second battery to run your, your electronics on, and you'll definitely see a difference. Now, Lonnie, I just want to confirm if that answers your question. Do you mean also when you touch your foot pedal, your 360 shows interference? Um, because I know that I talked to you about it. That's something I've had a problem with with my Mega 360. And it's because of the head of my Minn Kota, I think, is, is the issue there. Uh, let's see there. Perfect. And then we'll get that question answered as well. Um, actually, honestly, we'll answer that too, because I'm assuring there's tons of people that have this issue. <clears throat> if when they touch their foot pedal, there's interference, what does that mean? Uh, there's a few different possibilities. Um, you can deal with a uh, harmonic interference uh, with DC voltage. It's not as clean as AC. And you're dealing with sensitive electronics um, that have that are emitting a sonar sonar wave, and a there, there's a lot there's a lot of electrical work going on at once. And these marine electronics are super sensitive uh, when it comes to any other accessories being ran. Um, that can be that can generally cause disturbance. Um, and and that can also go all the way to not using the proper wiring, um, and and it's it's kind of hard it, it's kind of hard to diagnose. There there's a lot of there's a lot of different possibilities, but it's generally uh, it's generally a harmonic uh, issue. Lonnie has uh, yes, and the longer you run it, the more the interference goes away. It's worse when you first start it, but the longer you run it, the less interference is. But it always there somewhat. Uh, he's talking in regards to his Mega Three Sixty when he uses his trolling motor pedal. Yeah, and you know it, it's always good to check uh, to make sure that you're not actually running any of your electronics off of your trolling motor batteries. Uh, and I've heard of that happening in the past. Uh, yeah, gener yeah, generally the larger the diameter of your your conductor, the less voltage the, the you're eliminating your voltage drop towards the source or towards your your electronics. Um, to get back on my topic, the um, yeah, it's it there there's a lot of there's a lot of different uh possibilities if you have your your electronics actually connected to your trolling motor batteries. Um what he says, and I have wiring, seen that the wiring is ran straight to the cranking battery. So does that mean it's isolated or is there a bunch of other stuff on that battery? That would probably also be a kill for it. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're running in your bilge or your aerator for your live wells, that can that can definitely damper it. Um, and then if you're also, it depends on how long you're running that 360 for, because the longer you run it, the less voltage you have, and then you'll definitely start to see interference come into play. And I think this is what's crazy is power poles are on the cranking battery as well. Yeah, that's. And this is where it's so crazy, where back in the day, running four batteries, five batteries, there are some pros that are running like six and seven. It, and, and I get it. The more crap you put on a boat, the more batteries you need. Uh, in your mind, let's say you're running two graphs up front, Mega and 360. Let's go crazy. Two graphs at the console, and you got power poles. How many batteries should you have when you also have a 36-volt trolling motor set up? You should do two. Um, and let's just say we've got, you know, two 12s at the bow and two 12s at the console. Um, I try and go with the largest starting battery that I can. And it wasn't once popular to run them in parallel. Um, but I like to have that. I like to keep things isolated. So my cranking battery serves for the shallow water anchors. Um, 
and are also isolated by and and I, and I mean that by a switch so i can actually turn those power poles off if they're not in use or talons or raptors and then i will have all of my electronics go to the largest either lithium at a 100 amp hour and this is just i i do the calculations for this but just hypothetically uh i'd go to the largest either deep cycle agm group 31 or to a lithium system just for your electronics and that will give you the capacity to actually run um, multiple loads and yeah you look at, if you look at the spec sheet for say like a solix 12 generally you're drawing around two and a half three amps which doesn't seem like a lot but when you're going off of a power source that is not generating um and it's it's a you know it's a capacitor it, yeah. it's got a it's either it's going it's going to die eventually yeah it's not charging itself while it's running it's just there um the the biggest the biggest reserve or excuse me the biggest capacity that you can uh you can have in your battery uh the better and and definitely in my opinion it, it, with that stated um a couple of questions I've seen looming around the internet is there are some lithiums that have 150 amp hour. I think lithium pros have some asinine, stupid ones. If you can get over a hundred amp hours, is that something, if your budget will allow you to, is, is that too far fetched to try to purchase that? I, I would keep it around a hundred amps. Uh, generally for the everyday bass fishermen, if you're running multiple graphs, forward facing 360, that's going to sustain you for, for an entire day. I mean, you can go a full 12 hours and that's going to, that's going to make it last. Um, I don't, I don't see spending $800 for, for a battery of that size worth it. Um, I, I try and either help my clients find something that's more on budget and just what, what you can afford. Well, then what is the, just, forget the budget we won a million dollars we won the lottery why do pros run you know those 120 130 amp hour stuff i know millican says he runs like a 17 volt lithium for his like stuff like and that's not even a 12 volt so like what what is the logic there so if you run a battery with a higher voltage uh voltage and opacity or your your amperage they're inversely proportionate so the higher your voltage, the lower your amperage draw is going to be. The lower your voltage, the higher the amperage draw is going to be. And we could get into the the engineering aspects of that, but you know, physics is for another day. Um, so by basically, say with Millican running a 16 volt, which I do know there's a few people down in this area who do that. Yeah. Um, you're you're basically you're having a larger capacity in your battery um and you're running a you're basically minimizing your load by doing that mm. so if i'm running 12 volts and i'm drawing three amps by the time i'm at a 16 volt power source i might be drawing one and a half so it's reduced the load so even a 100 amp or an 80 amp hour battery um, is actually going to last you longer than what a 12 volt 100 amp would last interesting that's interesting because like i was just curious about that like do you have to like if if some if millican gave you that battery does that mean you have to use different wire gauges will that fry your 360 or is that just a, a it'll work with the wiring it's just you have to afford that type of battery yeah so as far as the marine electronics go there is a rating between 12 and i believe 24 volt um some manufacturers are different. I would absolutely 100% check your your uh, specification sheet before looking to go above 12, just to be in this you know in the safe zone and not void your warranty. Um, but it's as far as your conductors go, uh, the voltage, uh, your variables for your voltage drop calculations would be a little bit different. Um, you would think it. Uh, you know, take the the thing about if you you fire a gun, say we've got a thirty odd six and we shoot at a hundred yards. As that bullet travels in that distance, it slows down. 
and it's the same theory when it comes to like electricity mm -hmm. it's it, it's it's most powerful at the source and as it gets to its equipment or utilization it's decreased and so the higher your voltage think of it the higher caliber further the bullet's going to travel that's really interesting guys i hope you learned something from that because that really i was always i heard all the chatter online about guys throwing like these max capacity batteries for a thousand bucks and like they're running 16 17 volts and like well is there actually benefit but you know you kind of hit it on the head there <clears throat> lonnie just came back with some information here which i just want to make sure we share uh, i do have the marine grade coating heavy gauge wire but unfortunately it does run alongside that, the that, wire. that's it that's why you have interference what does that that's do exactly everyone? why you have interference for for an idiot like me why is that bad so a trolling motor is under a great amount of load whenever you're running it um and we're talking you know your electronics might run two or three amps this is actually creating an electromagnetic field at about 50 amps oh, that sure. it is it's it's basically effect, affecting the flow of electrons back and from the source uh source of power to your equipment so that that electromagnetic field is actually causing the interference for your 360 so we just fixed that problem and wow. that's and i i brought this up at the beginning your port side is for your trolling motor feeds your starboard side uh is all electronics accessories the more distance you can have between the two the the better off you are Dave coming in here with the uh, Greg will be at the Dale city tackle show. So people can meet him and talk to him about the boat setup. Um, yes. Yes. And the MV will be at the show too. I don't know when it is since my map, my, my wife literally runs my life and just tells me where I'm supposed to be. So I'll be there, but I don't know when it is, but I'll be, I'll be fishing. The MV will be there. Um, I had another thing. Oh, with all the technology, we're getting brushless trolling motors. Um, people are, I mean, uh, Fukushima was running seven graphs this past year. Are we going to get to the point where we're going to see boats designed for six and seven batteries? Because it's getting kind of crazy. I think you're going to see a lot more restrictions in tournament organizations on what and what you cannot run before we start. We start changing the. Uh, we start changing boat setups. Oh snap! Okay, he said that. Hopefully, it doesn't get any uh, death email. W what's your thought process there? Hmm. I think I I am totally against banning forward facing sonar. I I just you, it's un it's unnecessary. It's a new, it's a new tool. It's just as as innovative as you know a power pole was in two thousand and six or what you know sight imaging was in two thousand and nine when that first came out. And there were there was you know there's always negative press about everything new that comes out and then that kind of just fades away. But I do see having a limit on the number of graphs and the number of transducers um there are some competitors and say with lawrence they're all running one active target there's and they have their own version of perspective and down and forward um but it is not called on the way that perspective mount has with live scope so you're seeing the garmin uh you know, aficionados basically running two different transducers or in Fukushima's case, he's running two off his transom. And then I think two or three off his bow. I keep trying three to look. Front, and it's like, it's like two in the back. Basically he can see anything that swims around his boat. It's, it's ingenious and it's insane at the same time. Um, I, I don't know. I, I just, it, it's a little much. It's it's like honestly, it's like steroids. When when somebody first did steroids and you didn't notice it, and then you get to the point where Barry Bonds's head grew a few sizes, and you're like, yeah, this is the point we reach where it's like this is over the line. Yeah, that um, looks right. Yeah, yeah. Like I, it's just you can do the eyeball test. It's hard to say that you're a, a sport for the people when your front deck costs more than the GDP of an African country. Sorry, that's just that's it. And then I will still, guys, in the comment section, I'll fight that the thing that's helped fishing more. That'll help you more than anything else is a spot lock trolling motor and power poles because that's boat positioning and fish can't get smart to boat positioning. They can get smart to 360 and live scope, but they'll never get smart to boat be able to control your boat. So thoughts there on that. Um, 
I see got a couple more good questions here, but uh, the last thing is like how, how, and this was a Patreon question um, brought up. I think it was by Daniel. I think how much of a, of an improvement. I'm going to try to remember his question. How much of an improvement is a brushless trolling motor? I think he said he had an Altrex, um, and he was thinking about upgrading to the brushless version. Is it really worth, is the bang really worth the buck? Okay. Uh, this is, this is great because I, I was digging it. I was digging into this, hoping that this would come up. So with having a brush, uh, a brushed commutator motor versus a brushless motor, the efficiency is completely better with the brushless. There's less friction. The engineering of it is basically inside out. Hmm. So instead of your uh, stator windings, actually the interior of the motor coming into contact with your brushes and causing heat and friction to build up. This is basically uh, with the brushless motor is you have your rotor, you have two permanent magnets, and then you have electronic components that will monitor the speed of the, rota the, the rotor actually making its revolutions. And it's using a magnetic field to, to, uh, to basically attract and uh, repel the, 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 polar the polarities of the, uh, of, of, of the magnets. So right there, you have less working equipment that's coming into contact less friction okay. uh, and better better efficiency hmm. and with uh and i'm I, I believe your your viewers talking about the Minn Kota ultrax quest yes which the which is a brushless motor and the former ultrax uh you know we'll call that the you know the older model um that's a that's a brush uh commutator motor um and it's and it's great it's great but with this new one you've got several different features as far as with uh you can monitor your battery life you can actually it's dual voltage so it's 24 volt and 36 so you don't need to upgrade your trolling motor you just buy one um and the price on it is not as bad as what the competitors are asking for do you think they have the best version or which company do you think has the best version of the brushless? If you're allowed to say that. Yeah, yes. So I have zero affiliation with any of these companies. Um, so, I mean, I can be as, I'll be a completely honest with you. I am a hundred percent with men on Minn Kota. Um, and my theory that I have is you've got a company that's been around creating one product the trolling motor for decades and right now they're priced at got it right in front of me two thousand six hundred and ninety nine dollars for an 80 pound thrust trolling motor hmm. I'm, I'm a really big believer in companies that focus on creating the best one product that they can and making you know making the necessary changes to it but keeping that 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 overall knowledge of that product um Lawrence and garmin they're super new uh they're i think they've they've only been out for four years yeah give or take uh they're about 30 percent more expensive uh they fall they both fall into the three upper three thousand dollar range um and i'm i'm more about getting the best bang for your buck and, and for a product that's been around for such a long time, definitely a Minn Kota believer. We have a good question here by Brandon Solis. <clears throat> Brandon says, 360 or FS, which should I get? That's a fun one. Um, and then we got another one by Russ. Russ, we'll get you, we'll get to your question here in a minute. Um, I guess we could both answer this. Uh, I'll go first. Um, where do you fish? You want to say it on three? Yeah, yeah, okay. One, two, three, 360. Forward. There. Are, oh, this is fun. Okay, cool. Um, I'll go first. So, if I think if you are going to be fishing the the Potomac River, um, and you're fishing shallow grass that's not topped out, 360 gives you the ability that you can power pull or talon down, and you will get a topographical view of every 
pile that's out there in front of you and you can make a precise cast to it. Um, and so you can use it in grass very effectively. If you are at Lake Anna or somewhere else, I would, I would hundred percent agree. You better go with forward facing sonar. But, um, if you're fishing like the Potomac river, random thing is what you're doing. I'd go 360. Uh, the other thing too, is I'm going to cheat by both because you can triangulate so freaking well with 360. I like, I, when I dropped down, I, I don't know how many times I was fishing this year and I caught a smallmouth that was key to my bag. And it's because 360 constantly goes, you don't have to point the trolling motor and off to the left of the boat was a rock that I didn't see. Then I could scope over to it and I saw one there. If I didn't have 360, I wouldn't have caught that fish. So I'm changing my answer cop out by both. But anyway, uh, go. Let's see. Here. Yeah. So as far as forward facing sonar goes with with uh, on on with my choice, I can see in real time what what's going on and say, you know, I'm fishing a marina, I can tell exactly where they're pinpointed to in their depth range and i can see how if they're actively chasing bait or if they're just in in sort of a you know a, a neutral state um so yeah i can i can get real-time results right then i don't i can't disagree with any of that information i agree 100 percent. i mean there is a reason why it's taking over fishing but and andrew redding says listen 360 is the deal in the spring on the river i, I think it, there's a reason a lot of those Florida guys like it. Uh, that's 100% true. We got two questions from Russ here. Um, first one here is thoughts on the ghost. I have the Altrex. So, from the my, I've had several clients who have uh, the ghost. Um, I've done a few installs. They're a nice rolling motor. Um, I've the only complaints that I've heard are. Uh, it's a little loud and the heading location doesn't, uh, isn't really, sometimes cannot be aligned. Um, but it's, it's not a bad piece of equipment. I haven't heard any horror stories. Um, but then again, I haven't heard any horror stories on all three. Um, and you know. I, it's so weird because like I've always thought the Minn Kota was reliable because I've had the same one. I have Gen 1 Minn Kota all trucks, guys, just just full disclosure. So I, I got it as soon as it came out. Um, no problems. But I've had friends I've had nightmares with it. So I guess it's just anecdotal about like your experience with that specific model or run. But yeah, um, that's a good question. And we got two more here because I want to make sure, you know, we're not here all freaking night. Um, Russ, Russell, again, do, uh, let's see, does he only, uh, does Greg only do electronics or does he do boat builds too? My son, uh, boat needs to do, needs to be redone for the res. Appreciate you. What do you mean by boat build? Like from nothing? I mean, uh, I guess a little bit more information about what a boat build implies too. Yeah. So as far as our full description goes, we do everything, uh, that we, relates to electronic in, uh, installations. Uh, so, I mean, you're talking from battery installs, shallow water anchors, lighting systems, trolling motors, marine electronics, forward facing. Um, if it's electrical work, then yes. But if it comes to actually, you know, building, you know, any sort of aluminum fiberglass hull or any repair of that sort, then no. And then I will try to get a fiberglass guy on as well. If that's something you guys want to hear, I'll get a fiberglass guy on. And I'll get a boat welder on too. If that's also something you guys want to hear about. Um, uh, Russ says again, tear out all his decking and redo it all. Even all the electrical stuff. Um, I do think I have a welder. I could have come on the show too. Let me write that. Hold on. Because this is how, honestly, guys, you, chat is how I figure out who I need to get on guest wise so keep that going there and then brew tank so no matter what you're running have the live on its own battery yeah if you want to go with that system that's what i mostly recommend 100 guys i mean i'm running i got a 36 volt trolling motor i have a 15 inch honking graph at the console um, I have a 15 inch graph at the front of the boat for 360 and mapping. And then I have a 10 inch for forward facing sonar. And that's all done basically on, I think, Walmart brand batteries. I mean, it's like, 
they're I, mean, I didn't break the bank with the batteries and it's worked pretty much like yeah it's worked all year like without any problems um so yeah getting the right wiring is so freaking important to get everything done and also honestly just the peace of mind that this stuff will just turn on and not have to worry about it and you can just go fish and i, I was really impressed because when i showed greg i got like again it's like walmart special batteries um but his wiring is so freaking good and and right. how he did everything it's worked all year and i was kind of shocked not because of his wiring but these batteries i bought were pretty reasonably priced and i thought like oh i have to spend six thousand dollars to get the professional batteries to last all year you don't necessarily have to do that to have success so that's kind of important too um, yeah usually if you can go to the group 31 agms which that price range is, it's expensive, but it's not as bad as lithium. You won't have the same battery life in a day as what you would have with, with lithium compared to AGM, but you can run your forward face and sonar or your, you know, several graphs and you can keep that going for the day. It's, it, it, it gets a little bit overlooked. Um, there just seems like to be a, little bit of a too much of a push on lithium at the moment but agm is kind of that why do you think that is is that just a marketing thing that they're pushing at lithium so hard i'm leaning in that direction i wouldn't say completely but i'm definitely it that that would make sense i mean it seems like a lot of the pros have balked there was that when lithium first hit the market people were trying to use lithium for everything now it seems like they're doing kind of a split, if I'm not mistaken, where a lot of them are running like lithium for just their trolling motors, but then they're going with deep cycle for everything else. Uh, kind of seems where things are nestling out now. Yeah. So with lithiums, they're very dependable with trolling motor batter as trolling motor systems and with uh, electronics, but you do not want to use them with a starting mode or with a, as a cranking battery the load it on when you're starting up you know 150 horsepower to a 250 is so great that the battery management system will actually think that it's a short circuit and the battery will go into basically a safety mode um so and and there's only i think a very few companies who have actually gotten a lithium cranking battery uh dialed in it's it's just a it's a new technology where that those quirks just have not been worked out yet i mean i, I just i don't know like li going down rabbit holes i just don't think lithium is the answer like long term with battery technology because it's such a it's a valuable mineral and unless we get solid state or something something else has to come along because I, I just don't think lithium is going to be the long-term answer um that's just me uh it, i guess i'm more worried about the amount of batteries that we're having to deal with because lithium or not you we are getting close to having to have six batteries um even with the power pole charge which i don't i don't know if i buy into that whole power pole charge yet i don't know why i'm not convinced i get that it's it's a really cool technology but there's something about it that just worries me i don't know what it is yet but it is it's a gut thing yeah i've had a couple clients who have had the charge and they've either been happy with it or they don't want it at all hmm. and it's it's just overall it's a battery management system that acts as an onboard charger and basically you know what you can do is plug in with shore power um so it's like a multi-functioning uh battery charger and it charges lead acid agm lithium um but again, as far as electronics go, you have you have an increased rate of failure just because it's more of, you know, over-engineered, you know, basically an over-engineered electrical component. The more complicated it is, the higher probability of failure. Exactly. Yeah. It's like when you look at German engineering during World War II. It's like it runs great until it doesn't. And that's kind of why i went with the um the five bank by minkota is i just like the idea of everything separate and neat and if something fails it's just it's it's just that and um i've had issues in the past where i tried to run too much stuff on too few batteries so that was kind of what led me to agree with your assessment of what i should do with my boat mm -hmm. greg yeah 
thank you so much for coming on. I, I, I don't want to keep you for six hours. Um, is there anything else that we need to touch on? I think we've, I mean, I think we've had a great discussion. I mean, I do greatly appreciate you having me on. No, absolutely. And then, and then guys, as always, uh, this live stream is going to be re-uploaded hopefully tomorrow morning if I get this thing done and polished in time as a podcast episode and be really uploaded on YouTube with a link in the episode description to everything for New Horizon boat builds. Uh, Ross says, I'm going to call you this week, brother. So cool. It sounds like you're going to have somebody reach out to you right now. Again, you know, go definitely reach out to get your wiring done. There are so many people that are trying to run forward facing sonar. That'll help a lot to get the wiring done correctly. And then you just do not have to worry about it anymore. It's the best investment you could make. It was the best money I spent all year. Uh, and I bought my wife a horse. So that's saying something. Um, so just give that a check, uh, like, and subscribe to the channel. And then, yeah, we'll see you guys next time on fishing the DMV. We'll, we'll see you guys next week. And again, guys, as always, we are cutting back desk down to Monday night lives from now on until we hit hundred Patreon subscribers. We're only 42 away from that. And then I'm going to be cranking out three to four episodes a week. So check us out on Patreon. If you want us to, if you want to see more episodes, we'll see you next time. Talk to you later. Bye. You're listening to fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aaron's and Jared mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's bait and tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.